<laughs> All right, well, hello everyone. I'm Cassie Barlow and I'm the president of the Strategic Ohio Council for Higher Education. And I wanna welcome everyone here today for our panel discussion regarding teaching at a two-year college. And I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and thank you to the students who have joined us today as well. Um, for the students who are um, with us on the Zoom, if you could enter your information in the chat box so we can make sure to follow up with you, we'd appreciate it. And um, just to give you a little bit of background about what led us to this conversation today, uh, so she is particip participating along with the University of Dayton and Clark State College in a National Science Foundation grant called Aspire. And this grant is focused on the recruitment of students to um, teaching opportunities at uh, two-year colleges. So that's why we're here today to uh, do a little bit of education around teaching at a two-year college and to answer any questions that students have. And um, like I said, happy to have you all with us today. Um, I would like to do a quick introduction of our panelists who are here with us this, this afternoon. And, uh, and then each of them will do an introduction that gets a little bit more in depth uh, on, their, on their backgrounds. So let's start this, this afternoon with Dr. Patience Olajide who is an assistant professor for health and human services. Um, Dr. Olajide, Dr. thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Next is Nick Schmall, who is an assistant professor of arts and sciences. Nick, you get the prize for the best tie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it was a big crowd pleaser. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Next is Shanpathina Sarapokia, and I hope I got that mostly right, um, who is an assistant professor of arts and sciences. Thank you. You can just call me Chan. That's much easier. Chan, all right, got, got it. <laughs> all right, uh, next we have Dr. Angela Courier, who is a professor and chair of the biology and biotechnology department um, at Sinclair College. And I good apologize. Afternoon. Oh, good. No, I apologize. The first three that I introduced are all from Clark State College. And now we're moving to Sinclair. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Uh, next is Phyllis Adams, who is the Dean of Liberal Arts, uh, Communication and Social Sciences at Sinclair College. Hi, everybody. And next is David Hare, who is a math professor at Sinclair College. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, well, fantastic. Thanks again for, um, for joining us today. And we're going to circle back now. And Patience, why don't you get us started and um, tell us a little bit, you know, spend about five minutes or so and talk about your, your background, your educational background and what you do in your current role. Thank you. Um, I've earned all degrees in microbiology, BS, MS, PhD, microbiology. My area of specialization is environmental microbiology with emphasis on bioremediation of polluted environment. Immediately after my doctoral, I was a visiting scientist to Tel Aviv University in Israel. And I stayed there for about eight months. Then after that, I relocated to the state. When I arrived here, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go the path of research or teaching. As a result of that, I had to register for a graduate class because I believe that the best teacher is experience. I wanted to find out how our classes presented within the four walls of the United States of America. So I registered for a graduate uh, class in public health, and that gave me a second master's in public health. And I'm glad I did <laughs> at that time. I am um, a microbiology 
and the anatomy and physiology uh, faculty here at Clark State. And I coordinate microbiology and uh, fundamentals of anatomy and physiology here at Clark State. And also I am a mentor to some scholars <laughs> at Clark State. And um, I'm also a mentor um, assigned by American Society of Microbiology to six uh, postgraduate students right now. So I have a cohort of series of mentorship I'm um, seeing through. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Patience. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we're going to move to Nick. Nick, can you do the same, please? Yes, my name is Nick, as you know, I'm a professor of physics here at Clark State. I have my background is a little different for a scientist. My bachelor's degree is in political science from the fine University of Dayton. Um, I was going to, my plan was to go into officer candidate school for the Navy, which is very difficult. And I found out how difficult. Um, it's also an engineering program and I didn't have the scientific background. I always had an interest in science. And I, after I had my bachelor's degree and hoping to reapply, I went to my local community college, took a couple calculus and physics classes, really enjoyed it, got denied again for the Navy. Um, so I was floundering a little and decided to get a master's in physics, because why not? Um, so I ended up getting a master's in physics from Bowling Green State, uh, photochemical, um, condensed matter. And my goal when I got my master's was to teach at a community college because I really enjoyed my experience. Um, when I went, my, I guess my postgraduate work at a community college and really enjoyed it. And so I've been teaching at Clark State for, this is my third year. I've been teaching at community colleges and four-year colleges for about 13 years. So greatly, greatly enjoy it. Great, thank you so much, Nick. Okay, Chan, you're you're next. Thank you. Um, my name is Chan Sirapoka. Um, I teach math and statistics at Clark State. Um, I my first exposure to to community colleges was uh, during my junior year of high school. I was one of the uh, post secondary students that took some classes at our local college uh, in Columbus. Um, so I had exposure to the college in, in the frame as a student uh, rather than an instructor as I am now. Um, so after, after high school, I went to the, uh, the mega university in Columbus. I think you know the one. I uh, got my BS there. And then I went to Ohio University to get my master's degree. Um, they have a great teaching program there. So that's where I went, and I, I, I always knew that I wanted to teach math. Um, I just didn't know where, but I think my experience kind of taught me that this is the best, best place for me. Um, currently, I am the lead instructor for our quantitative reasoning courses and our statistics courses and our distance learning. Um, I also work as a, as a co-chair of our Achieving the Dream cohort. And this is kind of a national cohort that we have where we're trying to use data to help us with achievement gaps of our minoritized students. So that's really one of the huge goals of community colleges is to kind of uplift the community and kind of get everyone um, to where they need to be in our community. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you to our to our Clark State panelists, and and now we're going to move over to our Sinclair panelists. So, um, Angela, could you go next, please? Absolutely. Um, so, I uh, I'm going to start off by saying I I am a first generation college student. In my family. Um, and, um, you know, I, my bachelor's, I had a, a bachelor's of science in biology. Um, my family was not into science at all. Um, so I'm not sure where that came from. I do know that um, ever since I was a young girl, teaching was something that I was really passionate about. Um, but I didn't really think of it as a career at that point. I just knew I really went into biology because I wanted to do something in med tech. I wanted to help people. 
Um, as a student, um, I had a really great mentor and advisor, which I talk about him a little bit later on, um, who encouraged me to go to graduate school. That was just not something that I ever considered. And so um, talking with him, um, you know, and, and wanting to teach knew that I had to get a graduate degree. Um, so that led me to um, getting my PhD in microbiology, go micro. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, uh, at Miami University. Um, so I was uh, finally got my PhD there and then moved on to a postdoctoral fellowship at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati um, for about three years. And then from there did a uh, one semester teaching um, as a visiting professor at Miami University and then eventually um, on to Sinclair. So at Sinclair, um, I've been here for 20 years. Um, I am a tenure track uh, full professor, um, but I also serve as the chair of the department. So in addition to my teaching responsibilities, I'll tell you a little bit about my duties as a chairperson. Um, so um, there are a lot of duties, but I'll just kind of give you a, a brief overview. Um, so first and foremost, you know, part of my duty is, of course, managing the department. I have 14 full-time faculty and anywhere from 20 to 25 adjunct faculty each semester. Um, with about, on average, 160 sections of courses um, that I have to manage. Um, obviously, in addition to that, um, you know, I have to I supervise and um, uh, evaluate the faculty. I also manage the budget for the department. Um, I need to, you know, I, I uh, make sure that we are always assessing our curriculum as well as our programs and make any changes where they need to, where those changes need to be. In addition to that, um, I serve as a representative on various committees um, and represent the department or the division. Um, and then I support uh, divisional and um, college-wide initiatives when it comes to things like enrollment, um, retention, and assessment of curriculum. So that kind of gives you a little bit of broad overview of what chair uh, persons do uh, in the department. Thank you so much, Angela, I appreciate it. Um, let, next, let's move over to Phyllis. Hello. So I'm Phyllis Adams. I am the Interim Dean of Liberal Arts, Communication, and Social Sciences. I have been here at Sinclair for 25 years. I began my time at Sinclair actually as a student here. Um, I was a student in the American Sign Language Interpreting Program. And from there, from student to Dean was a pretty amazing journey, uh, not one really that I had envisioned when I came to Sinclair, um, but it's been uh, full of a lot of really great opportunities. Um, I have an associate degree in American Sign Language Interpreting, I have a bachelor's degree from Antioch in Human Development, and I have a master's degree in higher education with an emphasis in adult education from Ohio University. Um, after I graduated with my associate degree, um, I began interpreting. I worked for about a year in Columbus and uh, I worked for an agency and I got to do a lot of government work. I did um, a lot of mental health interpreting and I also worked uh, as an interpreter on campus at Ohio State University. Uh, from there, I decided to do freelance interpreting, and I had so many wonderful opportunities. As an interpreter, I've traveled all over the world. I've been to numerous different countries and just had opportunities that I never would have dreamed of. Like Angie, I am a first-generation college student, too, so um, going to college was something really foreign to me, and I actually started college as a non-traditional student. I was 36 when I started at Sinclair. I had three kids playing on four soccer teams and I worked full time. So I went to school part time. Um, I went to school at night mostly. And um, then when I finished my associate degree and I started my bachelor's program at Antioch, that was a weekend program. So I spent every weekend going to classes again. And then four months after I finished my bachelor's degree, I started a master's program, which was on Saturdays. Um, it was a distance program through Ohio University, but I took all my classes here on campus at Sinclair. So for about four years, I had no life on the weekends. <laughs> 
and I was always on a soccer field someplace, you know. Um, but I have to say that I have had just the best opportunities. I started here at Sinclair as an adjunct. Um, and then I worked my way into a full-time position. I became a tenure track faculty member. I served as the department's uh, practicum supervisor for about 10 years. So I had the opportunity to be out in the field with students at their practicum placements. And I loved that. Um, the last four years of my time as chair, I also served as the assistant dean for our division. And then in the summer of 2021, our dean left for another opportunity somewhere else. And I stepped into the role as interim, which I thought was going to be one, maybe two semesters. And I'm now in my second year as interim dean. <laughs> but I love it. I, I love, I miss being in the classroom. I love teaching. I love helping students. I love telling students that they can succeed. But I find that in my new role, now I'm in a position where I can help advocate for a lot of our programs who then can make a difference in our students' lives. And that was my journey. Love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Phyllis. And David, over to you. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I graduated college in 1990 with the intention of being a high school teacher. I graduated with a degree in chemistry and a um, uh, what then was a certification to teach seven through 12. So I taught um, chemistry, physics, physical science for, for several years in the high schools. And, and I, I thought that was a great job. I still think that is a great job. But in the middle of doing that, an opportunity arose to uh, pursue further education, and I went to a high university for a master's degree in mathematics, specifically with the intention of uh, teaching at the community college for a while, and from then deciding where I would want to go next. Uh, well, that was many, many years ago, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm going to go anywhere next. Um, so I've been uh, I've been teaching for 32 years. Uh, I'd adjuncted at multiple community colleges. 20 years ago, I was uh, full-time at Clark State. Uh, and for the last 17 years, I've been full-time mathematics and uh, professor here at Sinclair. Uh, typical day for me is working with students all day long. For example, uh, tomorrow I go to a classroom at 9.30 in the morning and I don't leave that classroom until 4.15 in the afternoon. Uh, four classes back to back to back to back, and um, I am I am um, uh, very much a face to face instructor. I, I avoid the online instruction. Um, I like being in the classroom working with students. That is the highlight of of my days. So uh, I don't expect to change careers again, but opportunities abound at the community college level. So you never know what's going to pop up. Thanks. Well, I tell you what, um, love the inspiration and love the passion. I, I can't wait to hear the answers to the rest of your questions. I thought what we would do um, is, is take a moment and go around the room from a student perspective so we can understand who we have in the room. And um, so students, if you could tell us, um, tell us your name, where you're from, and what your major is. That would be fantastic. So let's start with the folks that we have here um, on our Zoom screen. Um, Chen Kun, can you go first? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my, my name is Chen Kun. I'm a, a PhD student uh, in University of Dayton electrical engineering. This is my fifth year. Well, I plan to graduate uh, next year. So I'm currently trying to find a, a job. I have uh, two years teaching experience in Shemne Julia uh, Catholic High School. And uh, I'm an um, engineer teacher in Shemne Julia for two years. Uh, I also uh, their robotics team uh, 
the head coach, and I lead their FTC robotics uh, challenge. And uh, this year, since uh, it will be my last year before I graduate, so I, uh, I quit uh, that job, try to prepare for writing my paper, writing my dissertation, and uh, finding a job. So I wish I can, I love teaching and I wish I can find a job as a, as a teacher. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Shankun. Appreciate it. Um, Abbas, can you go next? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Abbas and I'm originally from Sudan. Uh, I just joined uh, University of Dayton um, for a master's degree in civil engineering, transportation specifically. And um, this is my first semester and first two months in the United States. Um, uh, I'm a civil engineer all my life. I didn't do like um, teaching per se, but I did a lot of mentorship for the like junior engineers and site engineers once I work. Um, I work for around five years in my country, Sudan, some of it with United Nations, so I travel a lot. I work with uh, people from all the way from Asia up to Europe uh, in one team, and um, I work in Dubai also for six years. So I have very much good um, international experience everywhere, uh, not in teaching per se, but uh, that is why I'm interesting because um, I just saw the email and I think why not why not uh, try to share what I have or if I have potential even to teach. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Abbas. Thank thank you for joining us and um, welcome to the United States. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. So Ken, we're going to go over to you. So if we can go around the room um, in your classroom, that would be fantastic. Sure. That's not cool. My name is Ryan Landon. I am in my last semester of my electrical engineering uh, master's course courses. Um, I currently work for University of Dayton Research Institute, and I've been interested in teaching for a little bit and excited to hear about some of the two year opportunities in the community college sphere. I'm Don. I'm a senior accounting and finance major from Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm interested in learning more about teaching opportunities. Yeah. I'm Natalie. Can you guys all hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm in my first semester of mechanical engineering uh, here at UD, and I'm involved in research. Um, and I'm interested keeping my options open, deciding between industry or, or teaching. Um, so I'd like to you know, learn more about both options. My name is Peter. Uh, I'm getting my master's degree in engineering. Um, teaching has always been a passion and interest of mine. I just piloted a course on 3D printing this semester and uh, go teach another class in my current graduate assistantship position. And, hopefully um, we'll be continuing on in my education uh, for a PhD in engineering looking to do some sort of, of teaching and so yeah I'm very very interested in opportunities and insights that, that you all have uh, in your career paths and, and where that's led you learning more about the two-year path and, and what what that looks like as a faculty member and kind of comparing that to some of the mentorship I've had um, at the University of Dayton. I guess my name is Jordan Lingfield. I live in Fairborn, but I'm originally from Virginia. I am currently in my second year of getting my master's degree in aerospace engineering. Teaching has been a career goal for a long time for me. Where? That's still to be determined. And so I'm really grateful to learn a lot more about these two year opportunities. My mom is an adjunct. Uh, adjunct faculty member at well adjunct teacher at a local community college back where i grew up but she never got her master's degree so she does she can't teach a lot of the higher level math courses there <clears throat> but she enjoys what she does however that does limit my experience with two-year colleges to just like the lower level courses so i'm really curious to learn what are some of the higher level options that are available to teachers and faculty members with masters and phd degrees 
All righty. Thanks, everybody. Ken, can you do a quick intro, too? Hi, everyone. My name is Ken Blomer. I'm uh, the director of our Visioneering Center, uh, very focused on faculty development and the future of engineering education. And this is my course on uh, the college teaching seminar to help prepare future faculty to be uh, successful in the classroom. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. And thanks, everybody, for the introductions. I want we have two other folks online that I want to make sure that we um, that you meet. And they are um, our co program managers for this Aspire grant. So, um, Susan, can you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Susan Brown at University of Dayton. I am the director of faculty development in the Learning Teaching Center. And thanks to all of you who've come today. Thanks, Susan. And Tabitha, can you introduce yourself? Sure, yes, thank you guys. Um, yeah, my name is Tabitha Parker. I'm at Clark State College. I'm Associate uh, Professor of English, and I'm just excited to be on here, getting to hear um, everyone's uh, enthusiasm. I apologize, I'm in between meetings, so I'm in my car right now, which is why I don't have my video on, but again, so excited to kind of eavesdrop in on the conversation. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot, Tabitha. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. I've got some, some questions prepared um, to get us kicked off. And then um, if you all in the classroom, if you guys want to just, you know, give me some sign of high sign that you have a question. And if, if um, the folks online have a question, if you guys can use that little raise hand button, um, I'm sure you're smarter about these, these platforms than we are. So um, let, me, let me go ahead and dive in. Um, Talk to us, if you could, from a um, eligibility perspective and um, a, a requirements perspective, per se. So what are the things um, from your colleges, from Sinclair and from Clark State, that you're looking at um, when you're looking at a, a, a potentially a new professor coming in, a new faculty member? What are you looking for? What what is you know what is, are the must um, meet requirements, and then what is the sort of the icing on the cake um, when a, when a new faculty member applies to come work with you? I I'll be um, happy to start. Um, so for Sinclair, um, I think this is for all the departments, but I can definitely speak for biology. Um, the requirement, the minimum requirement in terms of education is you have to have a master's um, in the degree of which you're teaching. So for us, it's a master's of science in biology, or at least something closely related. Um, what we typically look for is, of course, that they have to have that. But in addition to that, any type of teaching experience you may have, um, whether it's, you know, as a visiting professor or as an adjunct faculty, um, you know, that's always and especially if you've got some teaching experience at a community college, um, because teaching at a community college um, and working with those sets of students can be very different than working with students at a four year institution. Um, in some respects. And so it's just always nice to have, if we have a candidate that's have, at least have some experience in, in that um, area is always helpful. Um, in addition to that, you know, if you've got any type of um, uh, uh, experience in curriculum development, and I will say that not a lot of candidates have that, especially if they've just graduated from a program and that's okay. Um, we're not solely basing it off of that. Um, but I think for us, just it really looking at um, you know your teaching experience, we always bring candidates in and we do a teaching demo um, as part of um, our search process. Uh, so we give each candidate a, a particular topic. Um, and at that time, you have about 15 minutes as a teaching demo. Um, that gives the committee members an opportunity to kind of see your teaching style. Um, and so that kind of gives us a better idea of how comfortable you are in the classroom as well. Let me add a little bit to that, just because I noticed there were several people working on their advanced degrees in engineering. Uh, there, there is an engineering department at uh, Sinclair, and uh, certainly you can, uh, you can teach in that area with a minimum of a master's in engineering. But also there's the, the possibility of teaching in the math department with a, an advanced degree in engineering, as long as you have at least 18 semester hours uh, in mathematics at a graduate level 
that would lead toward a master's in mathematics. So it's a little bit, little bit tricky that way. But, but oftentimes, the, the, those that have a, a master's or a PhD in engineering are so close that they can finish that requirement and teach in the math department as well. And I, I want to emphasize something that Angela was saying, too, about having teaching experience. There are so many opportunities to teach part time at the two year colleges that it is very difficult to find a full time position without having some teaching experience to go with that because so many other candidates will have that experience already. So while you're in graduate school, my goodness, uh, look for an opportunity to, to teach, even if it's the, one of the lower level classes that you would not need a master's degree for. Get some of that teaching experience early if you're thinking about that as a career. I adjuncted for many years uh, before I, I landed the full-time job at Clark State. I taught for Ohio University uh, branch campuses. I taught for uh, Muskingum Area Technical College, which is now Zane State. So several, several different places that I got some uh, community college two-year experience, uh, branch campus experience before I, I landed a full-time job. All right, thanks, David. Um, Chen, go ahead. Yes, I, I like to um, just add a few things. I, I agree with um, both Angela and David. Um, a couple of other things. There are, ex, um, you have to distinguish between our adjunct and our full-time faculty. Um, if you're an adjunct, we have a, a pool of adjuncts uh, that we, we choose semester by semester. Um, if you wanna be a full-time faculty member, um, the requirements are a lot more stringent. Um, uh, so for the math and stats part, you can be an engineering student or you get an engineering degree. If you want a full-time uh, position, you have to have 18 hours of math or stats in your master's program. Mm -hmm. So that's a requirement that, that we have. Also, um, if while you're in college, in your, you're in graduate school, uh, you want to take on positions that where you are the instructor of record rather than the instructor, maybe um, a recitation. Um, so the instructor of record uh, is very important. And we do count you know, that as, even if you're in, in graduate school, we do count that as a year of service. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're choosing positions. All righty, great feedback. Anybody else um, okay. want to add? Go ahead. I just want to add this to, all everyone have said, since uh, we are speaking with graduate students, if you do not have opportunity to adjunct, a teaching assistant is another position you can be looking at with your institution, because if you are a lead uh, coordinator of a lab, those also count in some institution as a teaching um, demonstration that you can actually also hold on that you have this experience. So if you don't have a place you want to adjunct, please, if you get a spot for a teaching assistant to work in a lab or help with any engineering, or if you are about, please go ahead and do that. It will also count. Good advice, good advice. All right, let me, um, let me break for my questions for a minute and see if there's any student questions at this point. Any questions that you guys have? Sure, I can ask one. Go ahead. A lot of four-year colleges have a lot of money for laboratory equipment. Uh, I just think of University of Dayton has a really big wind tunnel that the engineering department can do a lot of experiments in. And more than just research experience, they can also do classes with that as well. So the students get practical hands-on experience with real world equipment. I know that there are no engineering faculty members here from two-year colleges, but do any of you guys have an idea of what sort of hands-on learning opportunities are for students? I'm just unfamiliar with the differences between a two-year college and a four-year college in regards to laboratory settings. Um, if I can address that, I know at Clark State, we have a mechanical or manufacturing engineering program and they're unveiling their new workspace um, for that area. And I 
we have to be honest, I don't know exactly what all of that entails, but I do know that that they there's a lot of hands on experience for for students. And I have worked at a couple other community colleges where that was a big emphasis. Um, I interviewed at one in Rochester where they had um, sorry, I can't think of computer chip processing plant. So there are a lot of engineering related hands on um, experiences for students. Awesome, thank you. Oh. Anybody from Sinclair want to talk about your um, UAS program and your engineering program? And um, it's outside of my division, but <laughs> we do have a fabulous UAS program. Uh, we have a whole building that was built just to fly drones. And I would say across the campus, I know Angie has a great biology lab. Um, there are several labs within my division. And when I look at other colleges and look at their lab spaces, whether it's another community college or even a lot of the four-year institutions, there are many other colleges that don't have the luxury of being well supported with lab spaces like we have. Um, I would say our allied health nursing program is one of the top in the area. And again, they have an entire building that's dedicated to all of the lab spaces within um, allied health. Um, I know our American Sign Language Lab has been nationally recognized. Um, and I just think you would find really, really great lab spaces across the entire college. That's really encouraging to hear. Thank you. I think one of the reasons for that is that a lot of our students graduate and go straight to the workforce. And so we wanna make sure that they get all the hands-on experience that they can get before they enter the workforce. Absolutely, getting hands-on experience is really crucial to being able to take those, those head knowledge items that you've learned that actually apply them to a workable skill so that you can be a benefit to your employer. Absolutely. Any other comments on that question? All righty. So let's dive into the question about the role of the community college um, in a particular area. Um, talk to us really about the, you know, the demographic of the community college. You know, what, what, what's different? If you walk onto a community college, What's different um, in terms of um, who you're teaching, how you're teaching, um, maybe even what you're teaching, and um, talk to us about the role of a community college. I'm going to dive into that question <laughs> because I've had opportunity to teach for both uh, categories. I taught for, um, for a four-year college for a very long while before I joined the community college. The role of a community college is to help a student transfer to a four-year college. Another role is to be able to impart a career path so that they will be able to have this associate degree and start working. Another role that is expected to be achieved by community college is to be able to help with career skills. Take for instance, a student have left off school for like 10 years. The skills of mathematics and English is gone. So the role of community college is to help bring such students up to be able to re-enter um, the college environment. When you talk of demographic, hmm, we have first time, uh, first generational students. We have students that have left our school 10, 20 years ago because uh, they needed to maybe sustain a family and now they are back to earn a degree. We have students who are also changing maybe their career path. For some reason, they just want to do something different. So it's like coming fresh into a college institution. Age level, you can have from 18 to 70 to 80 years as my own experience, which is good. When you talk of the teaching pattern for both uh, four year and two years, it is so different. 
When I used to teach for a four-year college, I don't have the time to start thinking of somebody that is just re-entry or you are, you are, maybe you are, you just want to end another career path. No, I go straight, I teach the curriculum the way it is designed. I ask for questions, I respond to your questions and that is it. But when I came to community college, I learned what it means to say A is for apple, B is for boy. Because you need to go to the basics. You need to make them to understand that which they are forgotten. So you put a lot of this demographic scenario into play so that everyone in your class will be on the same page. Great answer, love it. Can anybody else, um, anything to add to that? Um, if you don't mind, I just want to add something. It's not necessarily from the demographic point of view, but it's, it's from the community college as a whole. Four-year colleges, a lot of professors are pulled in, in a couple of different places. There's an emphasis on research and maybe some other outside experiences. But um, as far as a community college, when you work at a two-year, your emphasis is on teaching. And, and that's it. There's some committees and everything, which always comes around. But the focus is always on the students. And that's what's wonderful. I taught at a four-year college. And we, had, we started focusing on this big emphasis on research. And that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so I came to a community college and it's it's simply the students. So you provide a great pathway for students of all varieties and all types, basically to get a hold into college, a pathway into college. And that's what you do. And you help them as much as you possibly can. And it's it's incredibly rewarding. And it is it's a great thing for students to have access to. Any other um, ads to that? Go ahead, Chan. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, I know uh, that our students, probably 50% or more, come to college and they start in developmental education. Uh, so these students, we have to not only teach them the material, but we also have to teach them how to be students. And that's one thing that you don't have at the four-year college generally um, that you do have. So it, it's a high touch uh, profession. That's a really, really good point. Um, thanks, Chen, for adding that. David, I think you had, you, uh, you came off mute there. Are yeah, you... I was going to, to add to that, that you get, um, sometimes you have uh, students that are attending a four-year college that just pick up a class or two here or there at the community college while they're full-time students somewhere else. And um, that is in, I've seen that increase more and more as, as we've developed more you know, online options um, that uh, there's a greater variety of four-year students full-time somewhere else picking up a class or two. I, I often get, um, someone from Wright State here at, at Sinclair that just just needs one more math class, one, one statistics, one calculus, one something uh, to finish up, uh, and it's not fitting into their schedule over at Wright State, so here they are. And if, you, if you're working in the summer, uh, I think that, that population increases all the more. Lots of students home for the summer, picking up a class or two, my own children, have done that. Uh, they've, they've come to Sinclair for classes or two here and there as they're attending somewhere else. I did that exact thing when I was going to school, David. <laughs> Phyllis, over to you. I think when I think about the demographics, I think about the affordability of Sinclair in particular. You know, we have one of the lowest tuitions in the state of Ohio, and it makes college affordable for so many people who thought that college was not achievable for them. Uh, we also have such great partnerships with schools like University of Dayton, Wright State. Uh, so many of the universities, we have uh, articulation agreements with them. And when it comes to University of Dayton, we have, of course, the UD Sinclair Academy. So students have the ability to come to Sinclair 
for such reasonable tuition. And then if they wanted to transfer to University of Dayton, they are able to get 50% off their tuition if they are in certain disciplines where we have that UD Sinclair Academy um, partnership. Uh, we do have so many first generation students, but we have thousands of high school students through College Credit Plus. So we run the whole gamut of students from 13, 14 years old, up to 80 years old. So there really isn't any typical community college student. And I think that blend and that mix in the classroom, you have young college, typical college age students that are coming to school for the first time. And then you have more seasoned uh, students that have really great life experiences. I remember taking a, my very first class I took here was an English class, English composition. And I was scared to death, but we all did writing assignments and we changed papers, you know, and I looked at a lot of the things that some of the other students wrote and the mechanics of what they wrote were great, but you could just tell they really didn't have a lot of life experiences. And what I love in the community colleges is how all those different age groups and backgrounds can share all of their different cultural experiences and their life experiences with each other. Great thought. Great thought. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? Okay, we've been we've been talking a lot about student pathways. Let's talk a little bit about the community college faculty pathway. So let's say that your entry point maybe is an adjunct um, and you want to eventually become full time. And then what, what are some potential pathways once you get into the, the full-time option? Um, what, are, what are some pathways that you can, you can follow within the community college? Well, I, I think one of the things that, uh, that we emphasize, um, if you are, an adjunct faculty and, and you want to be a future uh, full-time faculty is that you serve on some committees. Um, it might be, you know, pro bono, but this is something that goes on your resume that all of these colleges, as a, as a full-time faculty member, you're, you're actually a steward of the college as well as an instructor. Um, so it's not just your class that you're affiliated with, it's also the rest of the college. So uh, try to find committee work um, and, um, try to serve maybe as a chair on one or two, just to show your leadership. Yeah, so if you're looking at, um, you know, um, in a full-time faculty position, which is a tenure track uh, faculty position, there are certain criteria that you have to accomplish um, in your evaluations each year as you move up the ranks. So from assistant to associate to full professor, um, but even as you think about moving up the ranks um, as, a, um, as an instructor, as a faculty member, there's always, you just never know what other opportunities might arise. Um, you know, for me, I never envisioned myself as a chairperson, um, but it was something that um, just happened to come about and, and, you know, the stars all aligned and, and I've been chair for about eight years, but there's always those opportunities to move into pathways that are more administrative. So chair, um, assistant chair, chair, assistant dean, dean position, um, provost, our current provost was a faculty member, still is a faculty member in the mathematics department. Um, and so you, you've got those pathways as well. So if it's something that that you want more of a leadership role, um, certainly those are things that are out there that are um, opportunities at the community college. I'd like to echo what Angie said. There's so many different opportunities. And if I look at our current provost, our previous provost, not only were they faculty in various departments, they were also students at one time at Sinclair. So what I have found is that Sinclair has been such a great home for people that 
as students, they go out, they go to the workforce, and then when they have experience in that particular field, they often come back, they get as an adjunct, move into full-time positions, and then often up into leadership positions. And I love seeing people who were once students move through the ranks. When I look in my own previous, as when I was department chair of the interpreting program, I look back now, all of the faculty who are hearing faculty were once my students. So it's kind of a grow your own. Any other thoughts on that question? I just want to add that here at Clark State, the same uh, homegrown opportunity also uh, is obtainable. The VP marketing, she was a student of Clark State College. She became a faculty and now she's the VP of marketing. So you, you really have so many pathways, it depends on your passion. Fantastic. Are you talking about Crystal Jones? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. So um, now that we, we know you a little bit better, we're going to get a little bit more personal. Um, and we really want to know what was it that helped you determine um, uh, that, that the two year was the right place for you? What, what was that? If you could take us back to that, to that thought process that you had at that time. And, and, and I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear that from all of you, because I, I think this is a, this is a really important um, point of distinction um, that, that um, is good for the students to understand. Well, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm defensive jumping. <laughs> it's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I started my lecturing career with a four-year college. Then I had opportunity to adjunct for a, um, a two-year college. So I, I had, was lecturing in the four-year college, then I was adjuncting in a two-year college. And I noticed that there was this gap between this category of individuals. And as a, a person, just as my name signifies, patients, I find out that I can really explain to make the different group or the different diversity in my class, I could really uh, bring everyone to be on the same page. So along the line, um, after running after research, I just thought about it, that it's like I'm becoming too useful to these two year students. And uh, I love evaluation because I will always tell my students, you know what, don't make me feel good. Say it the way you feel because you will help other students come in after you. <laughs> so when I look at those evaluations, I became so attached to them. I noticed that um, irrespective of age, of the different diversity in my classroom, I can bond with them and I understand where they are coming from. And that was what uh, became a passion for me to just stick with the two-year college and go through the rank. Love it. Thanks, patience. Appreciate it. And how much pressure to have a name like that? I don't think I could do that. That's just too much pressure. <laughs> I'll, I'll share my story. Um, so I, I'll be honest with all of you. Um, as I was going through my graduate, uh, graduate school and postdoc, I realized that research really wasn't the thing for me. Um, it was okay, but it really wasn't my passion. My passion was really with teaching. Um, and so I, you know, I knew that I needed to find an institution where the focus was really on that teaching. And so the community college is, is really, um, really is, is where that allows me to have a career that's really student centered. Um, when I applied at Sinclair, I really didn't know much about community colleges. Um, but I, I still remember my interview and I was just so impressed by just the, um, the positive interactions I have with the faculty during the interview. And I remember one of the questions I asked, uh, asked the committee. The question was, you know, how long have each of you been at Sinclair? And the answers I received were just, I mean, they were so amazing. So I had, you know, there were people there from anywhere from 10 to 30 years. 
And to me, that speaks volumes over everything else, especially when you're in an interview. If you have folks there that have been there for 20 to 30 years, you know that this is a great place to work. Um, and so for me, I, that just, it really made me excited um, about joining Sinclair. Um, in addition to that, I really um, respect the mission of Sinclair as, as for any community college, which is really to be student-centered and to provide the help that's needed for these students to advance their careers and give them a better life uh, for, for themselves and for their families. Uh, my thoughts have been echoed by by the previous two, but and, and I already mentioned it before. But I went from a four year to <clears throat> college, got my degree, and then went back and took classes at a community college because I like to do things differently, apparently. And it was just a, a world of difference. Um, I had two professors that I became close with. Uh, they answered any questions I had. There was a lot of it was fairly informal interactions between them as well and it just seemed that they seemed to care a little bit more about how I was doing than the professors that I had at a four-year college and working my way through um paying my own tuition at that point too I greatly appreciated the fact that I wasn't paying for a football team or a basketball team it was just the education so I great I came to admire the mission of community colleges that way. And like I said, with the interaction of my professors, that's when I realized that that's where I wanted to work. I think I agree with Nick when you talked about the mission and I know it's in clear, our mission is find the need and endeavor to meet it. And I feel like that's what we have the opportunity to do every day in students' lives. <clears throat> I think we work well with um, local employers and the workforce to develop programs that meet the needs of workforce. Uh, but when students come to us, I feel like we really get to know our students many times on a very personal level. Sometimes we know more than we really want to know about students, but, <laughs> but for the most part, that's a great thing. Um, you know, and I think that getting to know everybody uh, so well, um, we build trust with our students. I think I have really enjoyed working with the whole gamut of age range, but I love finding that student that was the same as I was when I was a student and being able to share my own experience and say, I sat in that exact same chair that you're sitting in right now, and I did it, and you can do it. And I think there are a lot of students that come, especially to a community college, and when they are first generation, and they may not have any support outside of Sinclair, they don't always know that they can make it. And I think it's the faculty that often makes such a difference in supporting students and helping them graduate. I would say that the, the best part of my day is the time that I'm working either one on one with students or working in the classroom with groups of students. And, and most of the classes that I teach uh, now, nowadays involve either a, a lab component in mathematics or it's an activity based class. And so I have I have groups of students that I'm circulating through throughout the day and um, and that that ability to spend the majority of my day doing the best part of my job is is what I think makes working at a community college particularly particularly rewarding so um, uh, I have, I have students come to office hours on a regular basis they're coming in a little bit shy perhaps uh, but uh, they're coming in because they want to, to figure out how to do what they they haven't ever been able to figure out how to do. <laughs> they've always they've always shown me this mathematics. Uh, they always say people get it and and move on and and here I am, I still don't get it. I would say have a seat. Let's let's talk about this. And so that's that's a that's a great thing. And I think Nick mentioned earlier a couple of times that you know there's no other 
major influences that are putting pressure on me for research or, or other, other things. Teaching is what I'm hired to do. Teaching is what I like to do. Teaching is what I get to do at the community college level. Yeah, um, I want to echo what everyone else said. Um, perfect descriptions there. For me, um, I wanted to teach math somewhere. Um, and the community college for me was kind of the Goldilocks position. You got your high school, you have a university kind of on either sides, and it's the middle one that's kind of perfect for me. High school has its own pressures. I'm sure Dave, David knows, um, parents and all of that. Um, university, lectures, huge classrooms, hundreds of students in a lecture. Community college, we have maybe 15 to 25 at most. Um, it's a great way to get to know your students and actually have an effect on their lives instead of at a big university. Well, I'm quickly going to follow up with what Sean said. Um, I know it depends on the community college because um, I taught in uh, California before I moved over here. And I used to have 102, 96 students, 72 students. Uh, I know it's not fun to have a lot of script to grade. <laughs> but then for Clark State, yes, we have very, uh, maybe from, 10 to 15 students, which enables you to actually get to know every student in your class, which for me is just awesome. That's great. And we have a, um, a fantastic, um, fantastic answers. Thank you so much for sharing that um, personal information with us. So um, we have a question from one of our students and he wants to know about professional development. So how does your college help to um, develop their develop their faculty, um, you know, from being a brand new faculty on the on the team, all the way up through being a you know being a more more mature faculty member who's been around for a while. What how do you how do you develop those those faculty members? Well, because this is my second year here at Clark State, and maybe I'm. <laughs> no, it's good. Jump in, jump in. It's all good. My first year here at Clark State, I became certified as a Ohio uh, Teaching Consortium. I was one of the cohorts. I was, we were the first cohort. I was encouraged. I got that. So I have that certificate. My second year, which is this year, I was to, I'm supposed to be pinning for um, ACU tomorrow. <laughs> I had two semesters. Yes, two semesters of... Um, teaching a consortium declared and certified as a best online teacher. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, we have a lot of other um, activities, but these are just towards academic development that I've just mentioned. And this is just two years. And I, I think it also depends on the individual because most of the colleges, especially Clark State, you have all these opportunities. So you just need to jump into it depends on your passion and what your uh, path is. Um, at Sinclair, uh, for our first year faculty, um, once they're hired, they go through a first year faculty experience, which is a year long. Um, and maybe the other Sinclair folks can help me. I know it's on a Friday. I don't know if it's every week on a Friday um, or once a month. Um, but what oh, once a month, thank you, Phyllis. Um, so, you know, again, they're gonna go through everything that that first year faculty needs to know from in the classroom to outside the classroom, uh, where to access forms, how to submit grades. So you get extra support as a first year faculty, which is phenomenal, um, a phenomenal experience for, for those faculty. Um, in addition to that, they have mentors. And so um, we have assigned mentors that help those first year faculty. And you know, I'm sure most departments are the same in that any of the faculty that are in that department are more than willing to help uh, somebody um, that might need that additional assistance or if answer their questions that they may have. So beyond that first year, then we have a Center for Teaching and Learning, which um, sounds like you have something very similar at UD, um, which provides ample um, uh, opportunities for, for professional development um, for um, faculty at any stage. Um, of their career. 
Um, so again, from different pedagogy to uh, curriculum and assessment, um, to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and then we also have opportunities to take professional devel development through workforce development. So I don't know if I've left anything out, if any of the other Sinclair folks want to jump in, but yeah. I would say also in addition to that, um, departments do have funds in their budget to support faculty to go to workshops and conferences outside of Sinclair. Um, the Center for Teaching and Learning does also have um, designated funds that faculty can apply for up to $1,000 to apply toward uh, a workshop or a conference. And then a lot of times the department will pick up the balance of that. So there's no shortage of opportunities for support, for development. And um, I think that's that's it. I think you've got most of it, Angie. All right, anybody else? Clark yeah, said anything to add from here? Go ahead, David. Yeah, there's a lot of other informal opportunities that go on as well. Uh, I, I formally mentor lots of new faculty and also um, formally mentor adjunct faculty. But then in the mathematics department, uh, there, are, there are coordinators for all the courses. Coordinators will work individually with adjunct faculty or new faculty or experienced faculty in teaching a new course. Um, and, and, and there's also, in addition to what goes on, you know, in your classroom, there's bigger picture questions about, you know, how, how is it best to approach different topics in, in the courses? And so at our, at our uh, monthly department meetings, we always begin with, uh, with quote unquote teaching moments where people get, have the opportunity to present, uh, you know, this is the way we, we would like to, uh, as a team, as a, as, a, as a department, how we'd like to introduce these concepts in this class, or here's, a, here's something that, that I do that's maybe a little outside the box. And I'd like to share it with everyone else. So opportunities to grow in the way you approach individual classes always exists as well. Also, depending on the college, like at Clark State here, um, I had an opportunity to be a part of a SOA cohort, which is a leadership training. So I just finished that uh, in this last past year. So you have a lot of opportunity to be able to train and have another career path apart from teaching. If you want to be like a president, my president at Clark State, that's what SOA is all about. She teaches you to be a leader. So you, can, you are not restricted. So you can finish from SOA and decide, have an ambition, you want to be a president of a community college, go for it. So. <laughs> uh, the one thing I wanted to add though, and the community colleges offer a lot of research in terms of teaching, but if and when you do become an adjunct, please, you, you really have to ask and make sure you reach out to those um, resources. Because a lot of times, and speaking personally, they gave me a book and a syllabus and told me good luck. And it's that first semester is very, very difficult. You learn a lot, not formally, but you learn a lot informally. And it's a very difficult semester and you it's really need to reach out to people in order to, to find out the best practices. Good point. Can, can I share my favorite first year, first semester teaching? Yes, please do. Um, I was teaching a course that was called Community Resources for the Deaf, and we invited a lot of people from different social service agencies, and it was an 8 a.m. class. So every week, somebody would call, and this is my first, it was quarters then teaching. So I had limited amount of backup. When somebody canceled on me, I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to pull out of my hat to talk about for the next hour and half, whatever the class was. And I jokingly said to the students, if one more person cancels, I'm going to have to drag out my tap shoes. So sure enough, the next class period, I get a call at 730 in the morning. The presenter, her car caught on fire. And I'm like, really, your car caught on fire? 
So, and these were things that really did happen to people. So I dug through the bottom of my closet and I found my old tap shoes. And I just happened to be teaching in a classroom that had tile floors. So the students are milling about, they weren't paying any attention to me. And there was an old school, like high school desk in that room. And I got behind the desk and I switched out my shoes and I walked out and I like tapped out across the room and all the students looked at me like, what's going on? I go, guess what? Our presenter canceled again. So I taught the entire class in my tap shoes and tapped over to every student every time somebody had an answer to a question. And I thought, you know, this is a pretty great place to work if I can wear my tap shoes. And they invited me back to teach again. <laughs> and the funny thing is, those students probably remember that as their favorite day in the classroom <laughs> as well, I'm sure. That's great. That, that would definitely be a memorable day for sure as a student. All right, Ken, no pressure at all about your tap shoes. None at all. But... <laughs> So um, any, any student questions? I've, I've got a bunch more, so, um, but I, I wanna make sure that we get the student questions in. Any student questions? Um, I guess my question is, it sounds like a lot of you initially when going through like graduate school, undergrad, were pretty focused on teaching, but I guess, was there any line that you thought of, you know, going into, as I know a few have mentioned research or, going into the field and then because of that you decided no nah, it wasn't for me and then I wanted to teaching instead yeah when I got my master's degree I really considered teaching but um it was I graduated in 2009 which in the economy was just horrible and um I did get a job in doing research and that's when I quickly learned that, that research was not for me I worked in a solar cell factory in Maumee, Ohio, the south of Toledo. And I didn't mind the job, but as I mentioned, I knew early on that I wanted to teach and I enjoyed working with students and, and that aspect of it. And I realized that that's where I needed to be. So yes, I did have quote unquote a normal job for a little bit, but then went back to, to teaching. I'm going to add something to what Nick just said. <laughs> in my country of migration, you don't have a choice if you decide to end a PhD. Yes, I'm glad that in the States you have choices. You can do research and also teach in a two-year college and have a, a, another path. Once you end a PhD where in my country of origin, you don't have a choice. Don't even look for a job anywhere. They tell you you are supposed to be in the classroom. So, <laughs> so right from time, I already know that if I'm going to have the highest academic degree, I'm going to be in the classroom. So <laughs> that was not a, a navigating path for me, but I know I was going to teach at a point. Other questions? In terms of having like a, a full-time faculty member position i guess because the professors i've talked with like they will have um advising and uh, research components the time that they actually spend during their op you know during their their work day so i guess what does the timing of a typical work day look like for you all especially since community college leans more towards evening classes to facilitate those, you know, non-traditional students who are working full time, and 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 I guess yeah, how would that compare to a, you know a normal kind of nine to five in terms of timeline or coming into doing a weekend class or teaching on the weekends as opposed to teaching during the week? I'm just kind of curious what the time scale looks like for the professors. Uh, one of the big benefits about a community college is your schedule. I only have to be on campus for classes and office hours and any committee, but it's focused on teaching, whether I prepare for my class in my house or whether I'm on campus, it makes no difference as long as I just show up for, for the class. So again, my sole focus, my sole intent is teaching. So, and I'm only in my third year, so I don't have a lot of other 
responsibilities as far as taking student clubs or anything like that. Um, but it is very liberating. It's it's nice that when I start my day, I come in the office and that is my sole focus. Great papers, get ready for the next class and see students. But it's I really enjoy it. And that is my favorite thing about this position is just that focus. When you talk about students coming in to take uh, evening classes, I know of recent year at Clark State, they, um, they kind of recruit uh, a teaching position that is evening. So nothing is actually thrown at you because your classes are scheduled, you are, uh, you, you are communicated across, they tell you everything that are you available to teach this class at this time. So nothing is actually thrown at you. So if you decide, okay, I'm, I want to teach in the evenings and those classes are available, you have them. And there are also some instructors that are actually uh, recruited because they want them to teach a particular at a particular time, maybe weekend, and is there we need a faculty for weekend classes. Let me add a little bit to that. I used to teach, my schedule used to be that I would have classes from basically 8 a.m. till noon, no classes all afternoon long, and uh, I would usually go home. And then I would come back at 5.30 and teach from about 5.30 to 8 or 8.30 uh, in the evenings. Um, and, and that was a fine schedule with me uh, at that point in my life. Uh, that was before I had children of my own, before I had the, the father responsibilities. Uh, and as my, as my um, other responsibilities changed, I was able to change my schedule at the community college level, largely because of the, the size of the mathematics department here at Sinclair. There are so many faculty and so many adjunct faculty that there's someone available at just about any time, day or night, weekend, that is willing to take a course that, uh, that I requested specific times to teach rather than requested specific courses to teach. So I spent uh, a lot of years where I was teaching all calculus, all high level courses. I spent other years where I was teaching all developmental mathematics courses, all algebra, high school algebra or below. Um, I'm currently uh, teaching a lot of the courses for future elementary school teachers and um, a lot of courses for health science fields. Um, the mathematics for, for those areas, uh, just a huge variety of courses, huge variety of times. And I found it very easy to, to, to mate my work schedule with my home life and my, my parenting responsibilities. Just also help the student that asked the question, uh, here at Clark State, you are not bound to respond to any email after 5 p.m. So your email actually drops after 5 p.m. 5 p.m. You may not get email from your colleagues. And for me, that means that respect is there. It is time to rest. So you are not, if it's not urgent, your all your email can wait till the next day after 5 p.m. <laughs> yeah, uh, to echo David, at Sinclair, um, well, any community college, and it's really the flexibility that's nice. Um, so I don't know if it's the same at all community colleges, but at Sinclair, um, our minimum requirement as a full-time faculty member is something, it's 15 payload hours. So that kind of, depending on the course, so for the biology department, that's usually about, I don't know, four lectures and maybe three to four labs, but you can fit those in, um, you know, the schedule that you want. And so for our department, um, faculty kind of give us, you know, here's here's what I would like. Here are the here's when I would like to start and when I'm available. And here's kind of when I need to go home because I have kids coming off the bus. Um, we work really hard to try to accommodate them, and for the most part, we're able to do that because we do have adjuncts that we can fill in other places where we need uh, those courses taught. So it's just nice, and that's that's the other reason why I. Um, I, I was really fortunate to um, be employed at a community college, especially when my kids were little. Uh, I had the ability to not teach at summer and not do anything at summer if I didn't want to. So full-time faculty are not obligated to teach during the summer. 
I chose to spend that time at home with my kids. Um, and as they got older, then I started teaching some classes during the summer. But all of that flexibility worked so well, um, especially if you have other obligations and other responsibilities outside um, of the classroom and outside of your um, institution. And when she meets teaching for the summer, the summer is like your bonus. So if you don't teach it, adjunct is going to teach it. But if you teach, it's an extra pay to you as a full-time fa uh, full faculty member, okay? Awesome, Chen, go ahead. Oh, um, I just wanna echo what uh, David said earlier. Um, I, I had similar schedule where early in my career, I had, um, I was in at eight and I was out at nine, but in between I had some time off. Um, when you're a, a new faculty member, it depends on the college, but if it's very large, like a Sinclair, you may not get priority schedule. You may take, it may take some time for you to get up that, you know, that totem pole where you have the priority scheduling and it depends on the size of your college. Um, so every college is just a little bit different. And to be perfectly blunt, I haven't worked a Friday in seven years. It's been pretty nice. <laughs> All right, you guys, you guys anticipated my next few questions, which is um, benefits, benefits of working at a two year college. Any other any other questions from our students? Well, you guys asked some really good questions, so thank you. Um, let me turn it over to Susan for, for a minute. She's got some announcements. Well, for our UD students on the call, um, I am located in the Learning Teaching Center, which is the ground floor of our Rush Library. You may know us because we're where the Blend Coffee Shop is. That's how most people know us. Um, but we have a lot of resources to help teachers work on their teaching practices. And those resources by and large are available to you as well. We have all kinds of the latest scholarship of teaching and learning books in the holdings in this part of the library. We frequently have um, workshops and speakers. We've got a, a panel on teaching and trauma-informed teaching and advising coming up in a few weeks. So, um, Hopefully you're getting emails from the Learning Teaching Center. We had to get your email addresses from the graduate school, but if you're not, reach out to your chair or um, reach out to me. And because we wanna make sure that you know you're in the loop, you are welcome to take advantage of the resources that we have in the Learning Teaching Center. Awesome, thanks so much, Susan. Um, and, and one more shout out to all of our panelists. Um, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know about the students, but I know I learned a lot <laughs> about teaching at a two-year college. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, um, students, any other questions that you think of after the fact? Um, Ken knows how to get us. Please, please reach out. And um, would also ask for your feedback uh, Patty dropped a link in the um, chat box. We would love to get your feedback and um, learn about what you, you know, what did you learn today um, and um, how we can make this better the next time we do this. So um, Ken, thank you so much for helping us um, get all of this set up. And thank you to Abbas and Chen Kun for joining us. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and sign off at this point. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And Patty, thank you. Thank Patty, you. Can you email the survey to me? I'll make sure the students get it because we don't have computers in front of us. Yes, I will definitely email the, email the survey. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have a good thanks day. Thanks, everyone. Thank very you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.